In a place far away, a prince and his wife gave all their secrets to its queen of television. What? Revelations just kept on coming. From fairy tale to horror story. Day of reckoning for the House of Windsor. You don't like Meghan Markle. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. They were the fairy tale couple whose wedding united a nation. But this week, their interview has split opinion. Concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. I just find it so insane that that can happen within the royal family. So were you having suicidal thoughts? Yes. I think it's shocking. I think it's absolutely shocking. I think it's really sad. It, it's really sad. The Queen can come to common ground with both of them. A family divided and facing serious questions. Is the royal family a racist family, sir? No, we're very much not a racist family. We don't know who it is that they're referring to, and we're already seeing this turning into a very dangerous mm. game of guess who. The Americans think they had their princess, and she wasn't good enough for them. Often royals have found that when they've given interviews, they've regretted it. Tonight, just days after that broadcast, how did we get here? The biggest royal story in a generation, and where does it leave our royal family? He and his wife have said some very damaging things. And I don't know that there will be any coming back from that. Last Monday, 12 million people across the country sat down to watch Sorry. Harry and Meghan's story unfold. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. That's sad. Really. And she's shocking. Pre she was pregnant. Yeah. We joined a few of them. She's an actress at the end of the day, you've got to remember. So she could just be playing a part really well here. Many directly affected by the issues that would be raised. Race is not an issue if you're a white person. It brings it all, it exposes everything. That is disgusting that this is actually happening. His skin colour. I can't believe what she just said. I actually can't believe it. Oh, cheers, my love. What will our viewers and experts make of the week the House of Sussex rocks the palace? Also watching for us, Andrew Morton. In the 1990s, Prince Harry's mum, Princess Diana, shared with him her most troubled moments. It, it, it's very sad. You just think that they haven't learned anything, that they've forgotten nothing and learned nothing. In 1997, 12-year-old Prince Harry walked behind his mother's coffin. In life, Princess Diana used Morton's book and a TV interview to describe her unhappy marriage to Prince Charles. There's parallels both in the frenzy and also in the content. Meghan sometimes is almost using the same words as Diana. The loneliness, the isolation, the suicide attempts. I mean, it's, it's shockingly familiar. Were you having suicidal thoughts? Look, I was really ashamed to say it at the time and ashamed to have to admit it. But I knew that if I didn't say it, that I would do it. And I, I just didn't, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. Look, when, when you get to my vintage, I remember Captain Mark Phillips, the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, Princess Diana, all outsiders, all failed. I think many people have just been forced to ask that same question again, why it is this institution seems so unsympathetic or lacks empathy towards commoners or outsiders who marry into it. And can you imagine how Harry feels hearing his wife yeah. say that after Pregnant. what happened to his mum as she's carrying his child? That's just, that's heartbreaking. What, what made her feel that way in the first place? It sounds like to be a princess, is to be a prisoner. She probably felt she had no support. Well, no, she ain't got no really support. Not, really the only not. person she's got is just Harry. And for those of us who've been covering the story this week, it's raised a lot of questions. It is perhaps hard for any of us to imagine how a palace lifestyle with all its privileges could be so tough. But in their candid interview with Oprah, Meghan and Harry revealed just how tough it had become for them. So how does a palace become a gilded cage? 13 times during the interview, the couple blame what they called the institution. I went to the institution and I said that I needed to go somewhere to get help. The Duchess's revelation to Oprah that she'd felt suicidal was shocking, all the more so because, she said, 
no one was there to help her. That I've never felt this way before, and I need to go somewhere and be good for the institution. I think institution is a word that, that Megan perhaps thinks people might associate with sort of stuffy, the men in grey suits, as she's supposedly known to call them. Omid Scooby is a biographer of the Sussexes and suggests perhaps there was a cultural misunderstanding. You know, we have to remember that a lot of the staff were stuck in a really difficult place. They had to be loyal to the Sussexes, but at the same time, their role is really there to uh, uphold the values of the Crown and the institution, and that, that's really why they're there. The Royal Institution is, um, goes back a thousand years. The Queen is the present monarch, and this has endured a lot. It's been through a reformation, two world wars. Meghan claims the institution held her passport, stopped her going out, and denied help for her suicidal depression. I went to the institution. This was emails and begging. I am concerned for my mental welfare. But for those who know Harry, the lack of help is still hard to understand. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, William, Kate and Harry set up the Royal Foundation and a lot of it was to make a platform for people who didn't dare speak out about a mental illness. And they've become very knowledgeable about it and very informed. We're particularly happy uh, to be at our first Royal Foundation event with Meghan. I couldn't understand why Harry didn't try and find someone for her, why um, he didn't get on the phone and ask who was the best pe person for her. I, I find that extraordinary. Working as, as family does have its challenges, of course it does. Everybody here, the fact that everyone's laughing means that everybody <laughs> knows exactly what it's like. I don't expect the royal family and people around her to understand what she's experiencing, but to be understanding that what she's experiencing is real. They don't have a voice and they're in a void of silence. So it just perpetuates those feelings of suicide. You were ashamed of admitting that Megan needed help. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't have anyone to turn to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got some very close friends that, that have been with us through this whole process. Mm. But for the family, they very much have this mentality of, this is just how it is. This is how it's meant to be. You can't change it. We've all been through it. Megan was praised by some for her courage in speaking out about mental health. 
But after some high-profile criticisms of the couple's account, I wouldn't believe it if she read me a weather report. With Piers Morgan first walking out... You don't like Meghan Markle. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Then leaving his morning show, Meghan authorised Janina Gavanka, her actor friend of 17 years, to speak to ITV's This Morning. I talk to them all of the time. We watch the special together. How come she had no one to go to? I believe she said that she had no one to turn to within the institution. She right. turns to all of us. She turns to her husband. I know that the family and the staff were well aware of the extent of it. And though their recollections may vary, ours don't because we lived through it with them. And there are many emails and texts to support that. Janina was also allowed to address the bullying claims against Meghan and to share a different allegation about why a member of staff had left. I can say she's not a bully, but I also know why someone had to leave and it was for gross misconduct. And the truth will come out. There's plenty of emails and texts about that. As friends suggest there is evidence and the palace bring in an independent investigator, Others question Meghan's claim she had no help in learning her new role. Unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to, how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. That was not something that was offered to me. Was she really left to Google the national anthem? So nobody tells you anything? No. Harry said to me that he'd spent a lot of time explaining what it was going to be like. The Queen helped out. She had a, a favourite and very efficient assistant. And that senior assistant, I am told, was one of a number of the Queen's most trusted advisers who Meghan was given access to, to help her adjust. What this couple have now done is to put a lot of material out into the public domain, which can be examined by a great number of people, including indeed, I suppose, people like me, and occasionally we will find contradictions in what they say and I think eventually this will probably rebound very badly on them. So to say nothing is actually sometimes a very good policy. Harry and Meghan say they stand by everything they said to Oprah. As the world waited, the palace indicated it would issue a response but it wouldn't be rushed into one. Then on Tuesday, in just four sentences, the Queen released a statement the concerning matters, she said, would we dealt with privately. I mean, 61 words issued 40 hours after the programme went to air in America, saying, yes, we have listened to what you've said. Recollections may vary. I mean, that's basically saying we've listened to it, but we're not taking it as gospel. The 61 word response, that doesn't cut it. Take some ownership. Share with us how you really feel. This was a huge mistake. I have huge sympathy for the Queen at the moment. Here she is approaching her 95th birthday. Her husband has been ill in hospital. And suddenly, out of nowhere, her beloved grandson, Harry, throws this catastrophe into her lap. In the interview itself, Harry was careful to praise the Queen but said his father and brother were the ones who were trapped like he had been. Please explain how you, Prince Harry, raised in a palace, in a life of privilege, literally a prince, how you were trapped. Trapped within the system, like the rest of my family are. My father and my brother, they are trapped. <laughs> they don't get to leave, and I have huge compassion for that. The couple used the interview to justify their sudden decision to quit as senior royals last year and defended themselves from claims they'd blindsided the Queen. I had uh, three conversations with my grandmother and two conversations with my father um, before he stopped taking my calls and then said, can you put this all in writing? They've almost used that opportunity to have a go knowing that there isn't any formal comeback. We're not going to see the Queen going on the This Morning sofa with Holly and Phil and discussing her family's intimate problems. Sir, can I ask, what did you think of the interview? Often royals have found that when they've given interviews, they've regretted it. It sounds very cold and institutionalised in the royal family. 
You know, I just thought behind the scenes they were just normal and they just watched television like everybody else. I think Charles was thinking about himself. My views have changed about them, yeah, you know, so I'm definitely Harry and Meghan's team. But at the end of the day, the Queen has sacrificed a lot. And, you know, she's in her 90s and Prince Philip is really ill and, and I think that their timing could have been better. If they ever want any reconciliation with the family, then coming out with statements like that in, in public is just going to destroy any possibility of that. It was very sad that Prince Harry decided to publicly attack his father. Is he taking your calls now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. Um, I feel really let down because he's been through something similar. He knows what pain feels like. And this is, and Archie's his grandson. Those who are close to Prince Charles feel a lot of damage has been done. I hope that his relationship with his father is repairable. He and his wife have said some very damaging things. And I don't know that there will be any coming back from that. Arthur Edwards has been part of the Royal Press Corps, taking pictures of Harry since he was a baby. He misses the Harry he once knew. I mean, look, he did amazing things. What he was doing for this country and for representing this country in the world, I mean, he was tremendous, and I, I wished he'd come back. It's well known that him and William just don't speak. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, they, were, they, they only had each other for years. I mean, they did everything together. And what's happened there? You know, too, what's happened there? Meghan doesn't speak to her family. Now Harry doesn't speak to his family. And there they are in this beautiful house. I mean, it's wonderful life. But here, I mean, the Prince of Wales is today visiting two vaccination centres where he's going to sort of support the, 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 the health workers and the jabbers and talk to the patients, comfort some of the elderly patients. That's what his role is. He's trying to give, lift the spirit of the country. And the same as William and Catherine. Every day they're doing the same. The couple believe that there was still a role for them as part-time royals, but the Queen concluded that was not an option. I completely respect my grandmother's decision. I would still love for us to be able to continue to support those associations, yeah. albeit without the title or the role. When they left this country at the beginning of officially January 2020, the Queen ex very generously left the door wide open to let them have a good chance to see how it went, kept on all the patronages and on the understanding that if they decided eventually that no, they didn't want to continue to be working royals, then they would go. That seems to me to be very generous, but they can't really have it both ways. And that's what they want. The most interesting thing about that interview in a way is the total lack of introspection. At no point for two hours did the couple ever say, we might have to take some of the blame for this. It was everybody else's fault Blame the staff, blame the press. And the press was one of their biggest issues. Over the past four years, I watched as Meghan entered, married, and then exited the royal family. Throughout that time, the couple's relationship with the British tabloid press was under strain. Harry called it toxic. But the industry is divided over who is to blame. The couple left Oprah in no doubt who they blame. So I want clarity. Was the move about getting away from the UK press or was the move because you weren't getting enough support from the firm? It was both. Both. Yeah. Harry has never been fond of the press and who can blame him? He was 12 years old when his mother died and he blamed the press for her death. He's been pursued by the press himself. There were embarrassing stories. There was the Nazi uniform, fancy dress when he was a teenager. He has been embarrassed by the press on many occasions. Early on in the relationship, warning shots were fired from Harry regarding the press's treatment of Meghan. I broke the story of their relationship, Harry and Meghan being together. He feared for her um, safety because of all of the press interest. His attack on some of the more um, unsavoury headlines around where she came from and who she was. That set the tone really all the way back in 2016 to what we heard on the Oprah interview. The fact is Meghan got the biggest welcome to the royal family anyone ever got. I mean, I can't tell you the, the crowds for the, the wedding. 
The interview shed a different light on reports that around the time of the wedding, there were tears in the palace over bridesmaid dresses. Mm. So specifically, did you make Kate cry? No, no, the reverse happened. I came to understand that not only was I not being protected, but that they were willing to lie to protect other members of the family. According to Meghan, the palace refused to correct the story. It was, she said, when it all started to go downhill. And by the time of the Sussexes' second tour to Africa with baby son Archie, they gave the clearest signs yet of the stress they were under. It's not enough to just survive something, right? Like, that's not the point of life. You've got to thrive, you've got to feel happy. I will not be bullied <laughs> into, into, into playing a game that, that killed my mum. A theme he returned to again in his interview with Oprah. My biggest concern was history repeating itself. And I've said that before, you know, on numerous occasions, very publicly. Um, and what I was seeing was history repeating itself, but more perhaps, or definitely far more dangerous because then you add race in and you add social media in. And when I'm talking about history repeating itself, I'm talking about my, my mother. When you can see something happening in the same kind of way. The inclusion of Meghan in the royal family was really, really important. If the royal family can accept a person of colour into their immediate family, not just on the fringes, it provided hope for so many people. And it's a real shame that it wasn't uh, the fairy tale that we all wanted. Coming up, the tipping point, claims of racism in the press and in his own family. In their explosive interview with Oprah Winfrey last weekend, Harry and Meghan made several damning allegations about the royal family. I've advocated for so long for women to use their voice and then I was silent. Were you silent or were you silenced? The latter. That they refused to help Meghan when she had mental health problems. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. I went to the institution and I said that I needed to go somewhere to get help. And I was told that I couldn't, that it wouldn't be good for the institution. And they claimed that the royal family colludes with the British press. There is this, what's termed or referred to as the invisible contract behind closed doors between the institution and the UK tabloids. How so? If you as a family member are willing to wine, dine and give full access to these reporters, uh, then you will get better press. There's mm. a reason that these tabloids have holiday parties at the palace. They're hosted by the palace. The tabloids are. You know, there is a construct that's at play there. Invisible contract. Can you that? So there's a what, party really? for drinks supplying for you to then give them good press. You so, like, right, the more champagne you get, the better press we get. I don't think they care about Meghan no, at all. No, I no, no. They more care about the press. press. A reference to holiday parties for the press. I don't know what that is. I've never had one. I mean, a couple of occasions, Catherine, William, and Harry invited us to Kensington Palace for receptions where we got to chat to them. Everybody moved freely around. You know, that was it. But there's nothing secret about them. They don't tell you, you know, intimate secrets about the family. It's general chit chat. And it was fine, but it wasn't a holiday party. I don't recognise that description of the invisible contract between the press and the royal family because that would mean that, you know, members of the press don't write about or broadcast things that are uncomfortable for the royal family. And I think anyone who reads newspapers or watches broadcasts knows that royal correspondents hold the royal family to account plenty. But the couple's criticism of the British press went even further. And because from the beginning of our relationship, they were so attacking and inciting so much racism, really. We know that their experiences in terms of the negative commentary in sections of the press 
did verge on racially insensitive or unconsciously ignorant. So let me stop you there. A lot of people say, well, what were they? Yeah. What were those issues that, that sure. they saw that other people perhaps didn't? We heard Megan called straight out of Compton when she grew up uh, three miles away from Compton in equal proximity to Beverly Hills, wasn't mm -hmm. called straight out of Beverly Hills. Uh, we heard one paper call her or refer to her background as gangster, gang scarred, gangster. Her mum was the dreadlocked woman from the wrong side of the tracks. We heard talk about her exotic DNA mixing with the blue blood of the royal family. And, you know, I think we also saw many narratives around Meghan lean heavily on uh, racist and sexist stereotypes. The majority of the press were behind Harry and Meghan from the start. Not, I'm not saying that there weren't certain elements of the media and certainly social media, but, you know, a lot of the UK press were behind Harry and Meghan as, you know, a story and a couple for a long time. I mean, just look at the coverage and the run-up to the wedding and the wedding itself. I know people say the wedding headlines were amazing, but if you add up all the headlines that Meghan and Harry have had over the last couple of years, they are overwhelmingly negative towards them. You know, there's nothing wrong with opposition. I get that. But that's why I say it is about balance. The British press have a massive responsibility for received in this country. While Prince Harry has had a fraught relationship with the British press for some time, it came to a crescendo when Meghan was pregnant with Archie. And it was at that time that the couple told Oprah they experienced something which Harry called shocking, a family conversation about their unborn child. In those months when I was pregnant, we have in tandem the conversation of, he won't be given security, he's not gonna be given a title. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? That is really unbelievable, but I'm not surprised. I think they're worried about the fact that it's now going to be mixed, mixed blood. It's not going to be the same sort of bloodline. So now it's mixed, they've got different cultures coming in and they didn't want that. There's several, right now. there's several conversations. There's a about conversation it. with you, with Harry, about how dark your baby is going to be, potentially, and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. The day the interview aired, I was told that Harry wanted it known it wasn't the Queen or the Duke of Edinburgh who made those comments. I'm a mixed race man myself. Um, my son's mother is white and I had uh, 
a former colleague asked me the very question. And the exact words were, are you worried about the shade of cocoa that your baby is going to come out? And the key word in that sentence is not cocoa, it's worried. Of course, we're gonna wonder what features a baby will take. But you'd have those conversations whether it was two white parents or two black parents, right? But context is everything and, and they've led us to believe that it was said in a concerned context, which is offensive. And the allegations have sparked debate across the country, particularly amongst those who most identify with what Meghan was saying. Yeah, this is just a bit of a fiasco, isn't it? I mean, they're being racist behind closed doors and uh, Meghan's not done anything wrong. She hasn't actually put one foot wrong when she's been villainised and demonised. Well, I'm mixed race, so we always would say, you know, the baby might be dark like me or fair like your dad. But were they saying it innocently? Were they just saying, oh, I wonder what colour the baby's skin's going to be? I remember growing up in the 70s, 80s, when it was racism was completely right. It was on TV, it was everywhere, you know? Like, and I just think it's now 2021. Yeah. Yeah, I just find it so insane that that can happen within the royal family of all places. It, it just goes to show racism is alive and kicking. It's exhausting trying to explain uh, racism and, and how it feels. Because no one can walk in your shoes. It's also quite hurtful when people don't understand, don't want to take into consideration that something happened the way that it did and also how it made you feel. When it first came out that Meghan had made Kate cry, people didn't question that. The black woman has made the white woman cry. And then years later, we find out the opposite was the case. And now people are questioning Meghan, instead of accepting it as they did Kate several years ago. It's racism. You can see the difference in how they've been treated. It's obvious to me. The rest of the British public that maybe aren't affected by these injustices and these inequities, it seems like this is the first that they're hearing of it. It's only through Meghan's experience that they're now saying, Hold up, what do you mean she said she experienced racism? What, what's that about? What's racism? It's when I walk up to reception in a big bank and I'm treated as though I'm a courier. I'm treated as though I need to go to another reception when I'm coming in to coach the chief executive. It's happened. And it's happened to Harry and Meghan. And on the question of race, that short palace statement issued on behalf of the Queen said, the issues raised, particularly that of race, are concerning. While some recollections may vary, they are taken very seriously and will be addressed by the family privately. But just two days later, Prince William, during an official visit to a school in East London, felt compelled to publicly respond to a reporter's question. And, and can you just let me know, is the, the royal family a racist family, sir? No, we're very much not a racist family. I did feel sorry for him because it's not just one person who made a quote-unquote racist comment. The whole royal family, the empire, going back centuries, it, it's all based on slavery and racism and subjugation of people and what have you. It's the establishment. We're talking about systemic and institutionalized racism, not whether one person said something inappropriate. It's a much bigger uh, subject than that. He didn't have to answer them, but of course, if he doesn't answer them, people will sort of say things like, well, he had nothing to say or angry William refuses to uh, respond. He was defending his family and the institution from the most, the most damaging slur that could ever, ever be aimed at them. But Meghan's allegations in the interview appeared to go further, that race may have played a part in the decision over the couple's son, Archie, receiving neither a title nor royal protection. When you're the grandchild of the monarch, so when Harry's dad becomes king, automatically Archie and our next baby would become prince or princess. While I was pregnant, they said they want to change the convention. What I took away from that program was that, that Meghan was 
suggesting that because their baby might be darker in colour than Harry, this child would therefore not get a title and not get security, which I think was a very damning suggestion. And I think I cannot believe that it's true. I think it was a little bit of a conflation to combine the, the concerns over um, the race issue with the titles for Archie and the security. Archie will, as things stand, automatically be elevated um, to be a prince when the Prince of Wales becomes king. I was told when Harry and Meghan announced their pregnancy in 2018, when we were in Australia, that they did not want the Queen to vary the rules to make Archie a prince. They were very happy for him not to have a title. They wanted him to be unencumbered by the restrictions that come with titles. And in fact, that story was borne out because when he was born, the statement that came with it said that when we got his name, that he would be styled as Master Archie. That was what the couple wanted at the time. For their supporters, the royal family's many years of work is strong evidence that they are not racist, either as individuals or as an institution. Everything I have seen in 40 years of writing about them, they could not, they could not be further from the truth. The Queen has been passionate about the Commonwealth all her life. Prince Charles set up the Prince's Trust to help disadvantaged young people, many of whom were black and people of colour. He has worked tirelessly for interfaith dialogue. Everything about him is about encouraging diversity and bringing people together. But did the Queen's statement and Prince William's words go far enough? There's no background of anti-racism. Even the Queen's statement, whilst it was respectful and it dealt with the matters it acknowledged them, it didn't condemn racism and neither did William's response. But obviously there is a large section of society that would at least like to hear that at this very sensitive moment in time. So where do the Sussexes go next? In the interview, Harry and Meghan made clear their future plans have been influenced by that decision to remove Harry's security following his departure. I never thought that I would have my security removed because I was born into this position and I inherited the risk. Mm -hmm. So that was a shock to me. That was what completely changed the whole plan. I don't think the British taxpayer madly wanted to pay for the security of somebody who was doing absolutely nothing for Britain at all and who was le basically leading, at that time, a totally private life. Which person who, who stops working still gets paid? Nobody. If you, if you quit the job, you get, don't get paid anymore. And so the couple say they've had to sign deals with streaming giants to make TV programmes and podcasts. Ironically, we're likely to see a lot more of the Sussexes in the media in the years to come. The Netflix and the Spotify of it all, that was never part of the plan. Yeah, Because I mean, you didn't have a plan. We, didn't we have, have a plan. plan. That, was, that was suggested by somebody else by the, by the point of where my family literally cut me off financially and I had to afford, afford security for, for us. I think it's fair enough that Harry and Meghan want to earn money to protect themselves and their family. At the end of the day, they're hyper-visible individuals and we know that this world that we exist in isn't always safe. And in their new home in the US, as we've seen this week, they are finding a sympathetic audience. I think they will be up there with the Obamas, with Oprah Winfrey, people who are not just actors, film stars, but people who have dedicated themselves to causes. And in that, they're almost setting up a parallel royal family. They'll be doing a lot of things that the royal family itself does. But in seeking to promote their brand in America, there's a danger it will damage the reputation of the royal family and the UK. It's something I put to Tricia Goddard, a Brit and TV presenter, now living in the US. In some respects, you could say that what Harry has done is, is damaged his grandmother's institution of monarchy and damaged the, the view of Britain abroad. This is not just racism, but snobbishness. The Americans think they had their princess went overseas and married a prince. It's that, that fairy tale thing. And she wasn't good enough for them. The queen seems to still be, of all of them, come out better. 
than everyone else because it's that grandmother thing, isn't it? It's that lovely old grand grandmother thing. And plus, the statement came from her. The granny was the one who's doing the, all, all the, yeah. the mending. The rest of the royal family, though, they're like, why are they all so silent? Why is his dad so quiet? I think the monarchy is perceived generally as very fuddy-duddy and out of date and that the expulsion or the wish to depart from the royal family by Harry and Meghan was another indicator of that, that this is a family that can't keep up. This country was besotted with images of Diana, the Princess of Wales, coming on her White House visit, dancing with John Travolta. And as a consequence, I think most of this country has already chosen Team Meghan and Harry, much as it chose Team Diana over Team Charles. But conversely, in Britain, the interview appears to have damaged Meghan and Harry's standing. Their popularity has fallen, according to one recent poll, to an all-time low. So what will the impact be of this past week on the institution that Harry and Meghan left? Overall, I think that what we saw was that most people were not supportive to Harry and Meghan, but we do also see some huge age differences. I think that's something that the royal family needs to be looking out for, because what does the future hold if you have younger people much less sympathetic to your main royals, and much more sympathetic with, if you like, the breakaway royals? The question now is what should, what can the royal family, headed by the Queen, do to repair the damage? Do you know, I'm no Republican. I can see the fabulous work that the Queen has done and what she stands for. I'm a believer in the Commonwealth. A progressive monarchy, we want that. Every king, every queen has changed the institution of the monarchy. There's no reason why it can't change again today. The dust won't settle for some considerable time on an interview that was every bit as big and arguably much bigger than Princess Diana's in 1995. Harry and Meghan revealed the strains and the trauma of a family breakdown, but their words about the monarchy and the press have triggered a much wider debate about modern Britain. Who we are, what we think, and how we treat others. This interview with Oprah is the thread that starts to kind of unpick the whole tapestry. Make no mistake, the fallout from this will, will uh, shudder down through the generations. I don't think any crisis that the monarchy has faced in the last century is as damaging as this one. Race was already a lethal topic. The palace is not removed from that. I'm really sorry. This is a learning opportunity for the palace.